we got Pastor Dave Twig here today. Yeah, that's worth a hoot. Come on. Um, for those who don't know Dave, like he's a friend of our house, been here many times, spoken, um, and, and we just love you, brother. We love your heart. He's, he's a young adults pastor at Bridgie Baps. I served with Dave for many, many years, and uh, at his heart is just a hunger and a passion to see people come to know Jesus. And so I invited him here today and I said, mate, whatever you're doing, just get the gospel in. Just come and preach the gospel today. And he doesn't need permission anyway. He's going to do that wherever he goes. He's always got some great stories. His family here is, is here as well. Raquel is amazing. And uh, it's just an honour and a privilege to have you guys here and coming to just serve us and bring the word in this way today. So why don't we put our hands together and just welcome him. Oh, thank you very much. It is, um, it's a real privilege to be here. You know, I often say this about uh, your church and I just, there is, um, there is a hunger. There, I always sense that, you know, when I come here, there's actually a really hunger, there's a hunger and a desire. And you know, the Word of God says uh, in, in, in Matthew 5, Jesus said, blessed are those that are hungry because they will be filled. And, uh, and I just, I often am so blessed. And even right now, I haven't even uh, really... Uh, preach or done anything yet but I just feel so overwhelmed and so blessed already just from the worship and the prayer is just amazing so uh, thank you so much uh, for having me uh, let me quickly pray and then we'll get into it father uh, we uh, thank you for the privilege to be able to come this morning and seek you and worship you and honor you and praise you great God and, and to hear from your word as well and this morning great God we, we don't want to just be hearers of the word but we want to be doers of the word and uh, Lord, we just pray that you'd soften our hearts for what you want to say to us. There's a temptation sometimes, Lord, that when we've heard a message a few times before or maybe several times, we can tune out and think, oh, I know this. But, but this is what's so powerful about your word. Uh, it just, um, you continue to speak through it. Even when we've read something a thousand times, you bring a fresh revelation and uh, we just pray this morning that we wouldn't tune out or just think, oh, I've heard this before, but that you would speak to our hearts and that, that today we'd just be impacted afresh by your love, your grace, your mercy and the good news of the gospel, great God, that we would be uh, impacted afresh and go, this is absolutely remarkable. And so I just pray, Father, that you'd speak to our hearts this morning and, um, and that uh, you'd, you'd compel us to take action. Uh, with this good news, we really do pray. Uh, so we thank you, Lord, and we commit these things to you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Quite a few years ago now, um, I remember this is um, pre-Christ, I should say. I was uh, about 18 and a half, I came to faith. And I probably, through my teenage years, had a few wild years uh, without going into too much detail. But I remember one weekend, my parents uh, went away, and so I had a bit of a party at my parents' house, unbeknownst to them. And a couple of mates uh, late at night, they were wrestling around on my parents' uh, lounge room floor. And as they were wrestling, one of my mates' legs kind of flung out, and his heel ended up going through my parents' plasterboard wall at home there. And I was like, oh no, and that kind of stopped the wrestling all of a sudden. And there's this big hole in my parents' plasterboard wall. And I thought, oh no, and how am I going to explain this one? This one's a bit awkward. And uh, my parents came back, I think the next day, and naturally, like it was obvious as anything, my parents were like, oh, what happened here? And I sort of just felt for my mate and I didn't want him to get in trouble. So I just said, oh, I was just like wrestling with a friend of mine. Like I sort of told the truth mostly. Um, <coughs> but um, I just said, oh, you know, I was just wrestling with a friend and my, my heel went through the wall or whatever. And my parents are pretty chilled and my dad's very calm sort of guy. And he's like, oh, okay, look, I'll be able to fix it up. And he was able to fix it up. And uh, I think about a week later, I was chatting to that um, same friend of mine. He goes, oh, what happened? Like what went down with your uh, parents and the hole in the wall? Because he was naturally feeling pretty bad and thinking, oh, what do I do here? And I just said, oh, don't worry about it. Like I just said that I did it. And, um, and my dad's like, he's fixed it up anyway. Like it's all good. You wouldn't even know. And he's like, he was really flawed. And I didn't think too much of it at the time, but he was really flawed. And he said, oh, what, did you tell your parents that you did it? And I was like, oh, well, yeah, I didn't, I don't know. I just, I didn't want to get you in trouble. And he was flawed. 
And even as I share this, actually, it makes me look amazing, which I didn't intend this to do. But, uh, uh, but, um, but anyway, and, and I, I just, um, I said, oh, yeah, I just didn't want you to get in trouble or whatever. And he, he couldn't believe it. He goes, man, that's amazing. I didn't think too much of it at the time. Um, but he goes, you know, because we had another friend, Ricky, and he goes, man, if that was Ricky, even if Ricky did it, he'd just tell his parents that I did it, you know, like, he, just so that he wouldn't get in trouble. And he goes, that's incredible. Like, he was really blown away. Now, I didn't think too much of it, but I was like, oh, okay, like, yeah, no, it's honestly not that big a deal. And I don't know if you've ever experienced something like that before where someone's kind of just stepped in for you and kind of taken the brunt of the consequences that probably you rightly deserved. And uh, he was blown away. But I know there's actually an amazing feeling sometimes when someone steps in for you. Maybe it's been in a workplace environment where you've, you've kind of done something that wasn't right and someone's kind of fixed it up or sorted it out for you or maybe in home, uh, home life or maybe uh, you knew you were going to get in trouble by your parents or just a situation where you just felt like, oh, this is going to be a bit awkward or I'm going to get in trouble for this and st- someone steps in for you. It's actually the most remarkable feeling. It's so powerful. It's such a huge, uh, huge blessing. And Paul, in, in, in uh, the Apostle Paul, he wrote most of the New Testament. And in Romans, he writes this and he puts it in this way. It's quite powerful. In Romans 5, 6 to 8, he says this. The Bible puts it this way. He says, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, in other words, when there's nothing we can do, we just simply don't have the power to be able to fix up the situation. He says, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly, which again is just this extraordinary sacrificial moment. And Paul goes on to say, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. We know what that's like in culture today. It's a dog-eat-dog world out there. And it's just like, man, if I can just, just get ahead of someone else, why would I step in and help someone else out? There's a tendency, I think, in our culture of, of, uh, of selfishness that goes on. Very rarely, Paul says, will anyone die for a righteous person. Though, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But he goes on to say this, and this is remarkable. The grace of God's amazing, but God... But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's a tendency, as I kind of prayed before, there's a tendency for you this morning to go, yeah, I kind of know this message, right? But there's something so, I don't know about you, but every day I need to remind myself, wow, God, your grace is amazing. Your grace is extraordinary. The sacrifice that you made for me is absolutely extraordinary. And I just think it's so vitally important for us to never forget the sacrifice that was made so that we could experience life and life to the full. It's extraordinary what Christ has done. But I'm also aware that for some of you, you may be not familiar with this message. It's an amazing message of extraordinary news. That's what the gospel is. The gospel is the good news. The good news of Christ laying down his life so that we could experience life and life to the full. There's a story that I read. It's a story. This is back pre-aeroplanes and traveling uh, when, you know, had, had traveled by ship. And it says this, when the California gold fever broke out, a man went there, leaving his wife in New England with his boy. As soon as he got on and was successful, he was to send for them. It was a long time before he succeeded, but at last he got the money enough to send for them. His wife's heart leapt for joy. She took her boy to New York, got on board a Pacific steamer and sailed away to San Francisco. They had not been long at sea before the cry of fire rang through the ship and rapidly it gained on them. There was a powder magazine on board and the captain knew the moment the fire reached the powder, every man, woman and child would perish. They got out the lifeboats, but they were too small. In a minute, they were overcrowded. The last one was just pushing away when the mother pled with them to take her and her boy. No, uh, uh, sorry, take her and her boy. No, they said, we've got as many as we can hold. She entreated them so earnestly that at last they said they would take one more. Do you think she leapt into the boat and left her boy to die? No, she seized her boy, gave him one last hug, kissed him and dropped him over into the boat. 
My boy, she said, if you live to see your father, tell him that I died in your place. It's a remarkable story of of heroism. It's a remarkable story of a a woman laying down her life for the sake of her son. But this is exactly what Christ has done for us. You hear these heroic stories from time to time and go, wow, that's, that's incredible. That's remarkable. But don't you see? Don't you see this is exactly what God has done for you? He's laid down his life. He's been the sacrifice so that you could have life, so that you could experience life here and now, but life forevermore as well. That death is not the end, but there is something more. Even just yesterday, my daughter, six-year-old daughter, was just asking me, Dad, you know, that, that she, we've explained and talked before about heaven, and she was saying, Dad, you know, there's, there's no death, there's life forever and eternity. I said, absolutely. And we were just talking about eternity, talking about a heaven, uh, talking about heaven. And, and, and it, it, it's just amazing. Again, as I was just sharing with her and she was getting a grasp of what this looks like, I just thought, this is incredible. Like, what, what I really deserve is I deserve hell because the wages of sin is death. What we deserve is hell, but God has made a way so that we wouldn't have to experience hell. We wouldn't have to experience a separation from Him for all eternity, but we can experience life now and with Him forever as well, which is absolutely amazing. So this is why Paul says... You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Why were we powerless? Well, this is the extraordinary message. You see, God created a world that was perfect and he created humanity. He said, I want you to subdue the earth and, and I want you to look after it. And, and instead of us looking after it and, and looking outward and looking upward and having this perfect relationship with God, we looked inward in our own hearts. And at the heart of the problem is the problem of the human heart. And we looked inward and we turned away from God and we did our own thing. And, and, and because, uh, because we've sinned, because we wronged against God, God had this moral law, this standard in which we needed to live by. And the moral law is basically the life of perfection. Now, who of you can say, oh, I've done that, you know, I've achieved that, I've pulled it, feel free to stand up, that would be incredible. But everyone, we all know we fall short of the glory of God. Even, you know, in Isaiah, it talks about even our righteous acts are like filthy rags to God. We know we've fallen short. We know we've done wrong. I mean, even when you're ripping down on someone and you're talking to someone else and you say, oh, can you believe they did that? Often we say, oh, now I'm not saying I'm perfect. You know, we just want to make sure that they know just in case they thought you might be perfect. Uh, uh, And we know, we know deep within our heart, we know we're not perfect. We've fallen short. And yet the standard, the entry point for heaven is perfection. So there's a real problem and there's a real issue. But God, out of his uh, mercy... God, out of his mercy and his grace, says, hey, I don't want to live a life separated from you. I love you. Why? Because he loves you. He loves you and he's got a plan and purpose for your life and he doesn't want you to be separated from him forever. His grace is extraordinary. And he says, look, the consequences of sin is death. Death meaning a separation from him forever. But instead of that, he says, I'll send my son into the world to live a perfect life that we couldn't live. We just simply couldn't do it. We're powerless to do it. While we were still powerless, Paul says, while we couldn't live up to the standard that God has for us, Christ enters into the world, incarnated into this earth, and he lives the perfect life that we should have lived. But it says that the consequences of sin is death. So what we deserve is death and separation from him. But Christ says, hey, I'll die for you. I'll step in for you and I'll die a horrific death on a cross, massacred on a cross. I mean, can you believe it? My saviour massacred on a cross for me. The least I could do is give my life for him. He died for me. Massacred on a cross, then rising again, which I get is just wild, like wild to get my head around. But rose again, overcoming death, so that I wouldn't have to experience death, but I could experience life. He steps in for us. He becomes the sacrifice that we desperately needed. It's absolutely remarkable. This is what Paul's saying here. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Who's the ungodly? Well, it's all of us. We've all fallen short. Now, that might be difficult to uh, get your head around or difficult to even admit to. Uh, oh, no, 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 my, I feel like I'm pretty good. I feel like I'm a fairly good person. It's the same question my mate asked me when I was 18 and a half, and I may share a little bit uh, at the end about my own story. But, uh, but, but, but I, I just assumed if, if I'm fairly good, then surely God will let me in. But fairly good is not good. Fair, fairly, fairly good is not good enough, I should say. Actually, it's not good people that go to heaven. It's forgiven people that go to heaven. And what we need is forgiveness. 
What we need is to say, God, I, I know I've fallen short. I need your mercy and your grace. I understand that Jesus stood in the place for me and I, I, I need to be forgiven by you. And you know, God answers that prayer 100% of the time. And you know what? This morning, you may need to do that. This morning, you've even come to church for many years and thought you understood this, but now you realize that actually this is what it means for my life. And you've got an opportunity this morning to say, okay, God, I need you. I surrender. I yield my life. I think Dan mentioned that before, that act of surrender to him. Say, God, I need you. It's a powerful response. I remember uh, one night driving to, uh, to youth group to speak at youth group one night. And see, this is the moral stand that we need to live up to. But I was driving to youth group one night, and as I was driving there, um, I, uh, there was a police car that had just pulled over on the side of the road, and I drove past, and, and I just noticed the police car, and then I turned left uh, down Robinson Road, and I was heading down there. All of a sudden, I see this, these blue and uh, red sirens in, the, in my background. There was a few cars behind me. And as I'm flying down the road or whatever, I thought, oh, man, shame for that person who's going to be pulled over. And there was a couple of cars behind me. And uh, I saw one car pull over and the police car went straight past. And I thought, oh, OK, it wasn't that person. There was two other cars behind me. Police car came up to the next car and that car kind of pulled over. And I thought, oh, they're in trouble. But the police car went past them. There was one car behind me. That car pulled over to get out of the way. And I thought, oh, man, they're toast. Uh, but the, the police car went straight past that car as well. And I thought, oh, gee, I better get out of the way because the police car's coming up behind me. So I pulled over and they pulled in right behind me. <laughs> I thought, what? What have I done? I'm sure I wasn't speeding. I haven't done anything wrong. Anyway, a police officer comes up to the window and he says, um, hey, just wondering, uh, can, can I get your licence? So I gave my licence. And he just said, oh, when did you last uh, do your registration for your vehicle? And I was like, oh, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know. I better, you know, I'm sure I've done it. You know, I'm a pastor. You know, I'm sure I've done it. And uh, he goes, oh, no worries. You can actually just check it online. Pull your phone out. I'm thinking, oh, what's he getting at here? Like, there's something not right. He goes, pull your phone out. I'll just lead you through it, how you can check your registration. And so anyway, I pull the phone out. He, he, he leads me through it. I hadn't paid my registration. I was un driving an unregistered vehicle, which is the wrong thing to do, obviously. The law says you need to drive a registered vehicle. And so the consequences is that I get a fine, I maybe lose some points or whatever it is. Like, that's the consequence of my wrongdoing. This is the law. This is a standard that we need to abide by, that we need to live by. Now, what would have been amazing is if he said, hey, don't worry, I'll pay the fine for you. That would have been great. But um, he didn't say that, unfortunately. Uh, but this is what, this is the standard. This is the law that Christ wants us to live by, a, a standard of perfection. And none of us can meet it. Like, we just can't. We just can't reach it. But Christ, out of his mercy and his grace, he says, you know what? You deserve death. That's what you really deserve. But he says, I'll, I'll step in for you. I mean, imagine having to go through the death that Christ went through. Like, it'd be just absolutely unbearable. I mean, your skin, everything ripped from you. I mean, being torn to the point of unrecognisable and then dying a death on a cross, that death of suffocation, the cruelest death you could ever die. But that's what he did for you. That's what he did for me. It's extraordinary. I came across this story that just, it's actually just remarkable. And in, in, in his book, Written in Blood, Robert Coleman, it's Robert Coleman tells this story of a little boy whose sister needed a blood transfusion. She had a rare blood type, which uh, she shared with her little brother. The fact that he had recovered from the same disease two years earlier made the chances of success even greater. The doctor uh, carefully explained all this to the little boy, pointing out that without the transfusion, his sister would die. True story. Would you be brave and give your blood to your sister, the doctor asked. Johnny hesitated and his lower lip began to tremble. Then he smiled and he said, sure, for my sister, I'll do it. The two children were wheeled into the hospital room and Mary, pale and thin, Johnny, robust and healthy. He smiled at his sister and watched as the blood travelled uh, out of his body down the clear um, plastic tube. Johnny's smile faded and as he lay there feeling weak, he looked up at the doctor and said, Doctor, when do I die? Johnny thought that giving his blood to his sister meant giving up his own life. Yet because of his great love uh, for her, he was prepared to pay the price. Again, a remarkable story, but don't you see? It's what Christ has done for you. It's a sacrificial love. It's extraordinary love, laying down his life so that you could have life. 
Paul says, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. Though for a good person someone might be willing to lay down their life. In our culture and in today's age, you know, we see these heroic acts. I think I mentioned it before. But sometimes someone might go, okay, I'll, I'll lay down my life or I'll step in and, and I'll take it. You know that saying, I'll take, I'll, I'll take a bullet for that person, like for sure. And it's all well and good to say that, but, but would people truly be willing to do that? Uh, people might be willing to do it for someone, a close friend, a family member. They, they might be willing to do it, but would someone be willing to do it for an enemy, like truly lay down their life? And yet this is what Christ has done for us. We've fallen short of the glory of him. We've stuffed up and sinned and, and all these things. And God, out of his mercy and his grace, he lays down his life for us. It's amazing. But God demonstrates his own love for us, for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Ernest Gordon was a World War II a prisoner of war who survived the horrors of the Japanese death camp by the River Kwai in Burma. In his book, Through the Valley of the Kwai, Gordon described how the unbearable despair of the death camp was transformed into a spiritual triumph of church without walls. I love that. Uh, the prisoners of wars were turned into slaves and forced to build a railroad of death for transporting prisoners to death camps and Japanese soldiers to the battlefront. These prisoners were tortured, diseased, starved and worked to the point of exhaustion. Every man's hand was against every other's, wrote Gordon. At one day's end, as the tools were being counted and the prisoners were about to return to their camp, the Japanese guard declared that a shovel was missing. So he's clearly done a count and realised a shovel was missing. He demanded to know which prisoner had stolen the shovel. All die, all die, he shrieked. He cocked his rifle, aimed it at the prisoners and promised to shoot them all. At that moment, one Scottish soldier stepped forward. Standing at attention, he calmly declared, I did it. The guard viciously clubbed the helpless prisoner to death. And when they returned to the camp, the tools were again counted and no shovel was missing. There had been a miscount. Like wildfire, word spread throughout the prisoners of war camp that an innocent man had sacrificed himself so that others might live. An amazing story. And again, a story of extraordinary sacrifice. One man laying down his life so that others could experience life and not experience death. And again, this is exactly what Christ has done for us. Laying down his life so that we could experience, uh, so that we could experience life. Life in him. Now, like I said, for some of you, you're so familiar with this story, but I just am convinced there's something powerful about being reminded of the sacrifice that Christ has made for us. And this message, this good news isn't just for us, but it's a message that we need to share as well. I'm convinced sometimes you don't really know you value something until you're really willing to share it. And, and I think this is what God has called us to do. When we value and love him so much, there's a sense in which we need to share this with others. And, but for some of you, you go, I, I think I've, I've heard this before, but it's never clicked. And maybe to this morning, the light bulb moments come on. And it's like, wow, like this is what's been done. And this is a moment for you to go, okay, God, I'm in. I'm in. I'm conscious, uh, I'm conscious this morning that it's one thing to talk about it, but then there's another to experience it. And I just felt even yesterday, I had this prompting, I suppose. You know, like there's power in testimony. There's power in hearing about a life transformed. And I just want to share with you, maybe some of you are familiar with it, but I just want to share with you that today, like, see, I didn't understand this message. I didn't realize what this was about. I never grew up in a Christian home or read a Bible. I'd never held a Bible until I was 18 and a half. No concept of God, uh, and no concept of God or Jesus and never stepped foot into a church. But uh, I was terrified of dying. Why? Because, well, if, if, if I just assumed that you die and that's it, blackness forever, absolutely nothing. Nothing forever, complete blackness. And so I was terrified of dying. There was no hope for me. And you know why? Because I remember I used to think, you know, it's like I'm going to go to sleep, but I'll never wake up. I'll never, ever wake up. And even when I've spent a million years in that place, I will not be one step closer from ever getting out. 
And I remember my mother-in-law, Raquel's mum, I was talking to her about that. She said it was almost like you got a revelation of hell, just a complete separation and blackness and darkness forever. I never thought about it like that. But I just thought that, that is so hopeless. And I was terrified of dying, but I had no purpose in my life, absolutely no purpose. And so I grew up with this, you know, early on, I used to say to my mum, you know, what happens when we die? What happens when we die? You know, four or five year old, my mum. And bless her heart, you know, she, she would just say, oh, look, it's not going to be for a long time. But it wasn't that helpful. And so this stuck with me all through my primary school years and high school years. And a mate of mine around ele- uh, grade 11 shared with me, he was over one day and we we're in the kitchen just talking about life and all this sort of stuff. And we got on a death and I just thought, oh, maybe, you know, you could get reincarnated and things like this. And he thought that was crazy. And I was like, well, what do you believe? You know, what, like, how bad is death going to be? And he said, I believe I'm going to go to heaven. And I just thought, okay, well, if you're going there, I said to him, if you're going, I'll come too. Like, you know, like that sounds all right. That sounds pretty good. But, you know, he, he asked me a great question. It was a great question for grade 11. And um, I, I'd never been to church or anything like that. But he said, if you got to the gates of heaven and God says, why should I let you in? What are you going to say to him? And I, I didn't know. I really didn't know. I wasn't too sure. But I did say to him, I said, I feel like I've been pretty good. Like, I feel like I've been a fairly good person. If he's a good God, maybe he'll let me in. And we went through this like, concept. And he began to talk a little bit more about God. And it was kind of fairly new to me. But I sort of heard a bit about God. But then he began to talk about Jesus. And I knew then, I was like, he's on drugs. He has to be. Like, because no one, like, every, no one believes like Jesus. Like, everyone knows it's fairy tale stuff, surely. Like, and I was close to calling an ambulance. I was like, you've got to be on drugs, mate. Or I had some dodgy mushrooms this morning for brekkie. Like, like, no one believes this stuff, surely. But there, this is interesting because he actually believed it. Like, he genuinely believed it. And you know that impacted me? Because sometimes we can be so like, oh, like um, cautious or like scared about sharing. But he actually just believed it. And I was, even though I didn't believe it, I was struck by his conviction. Like I was really struck by that. I thought, okay, I don't believe it and I think it's crazy. But man, he actually seems to believe it. Like he has a conviction in his heart that this is true. And I was moved by that. I really was. And I said, how can you believe in a God you can't see, hear or touch? Like it seems absurd. And he goes, yeah, it's a great point. Great question. He said, I believe that if you're genuine, God will reveal himself to you. And I said, how? Like, how is he going to do this? It just seems crazy. We went through some prayers. But then he said to me, what happens if someone you know or you don't know comes to you one day and offers you a Bible? That would be a way of God revealing himself to you. And uh, I said, yeah, fair enough. Never had a Bible before. And then I said, oh, hang on. Because, you know, Christians, they're funny people, aren't they? Uh, they? They talk about, you know, these prayers being answered. And I often think... No, that's just coincidence. You know, that's what I used to think. Like, that's not, that's not prayer being answered. That's just coincidence. And so, um, and so I said, oh, okay, eventually someone might give me a Bible. Like, that's not God. That's just a coincidence. And he goes, yeah, all right, fair call. He goes, let's just make it two weeks. Like, two weeks. So I'm about 16 and a half of the time. Never been offered a Bible in my life. Never seen a Bible or never held a Bible. And within two weeks, apparently, this God's going to reveal himself to me by someone offering me a Bible. And so I didn't, I didn't think too much of it, uh, but we sort of, that was kind of like a prayer to God. But later my mate said he was praying his guts out, like praying his guts out, Lord. He put himself, you know, he put himself out there. And, and God, like, I'm just so thankful, so grateful for him that he did that. Um, and so he was praying his guts out. Now, a week later, we're going to class together. And I did nothing at high school except um, wrote raps in, in class, and I loved Eminem. Eminem was my idol, really sad, actually. Uh, but... Um, <laughs> And, and so we're walking to class, and as we're walking to class together, um, my mate went and spoke to the chaplain. Oh, I, said, I said, we're walking past the chaplain's office. I had no idea what a chaplain was. I thought they were like a guidance counselor in the school. Never spoken to him, chatted to him before. But as we're walking past, my mate said, oh, we should go talk to Dale for a bit, and we'll miss out on a bit of class. And I thought it was a great idea. And... Um, <laughs> So we walk up and my mate starts talking to him about bands and music and stuff and I stand in the doorway. And as I'm standing there in the doorway, I didn't talk to Dale at all. I just was like, oh, yeah, whatever, just standing there. And I said to my mate, oh, we should, we should go to class now after about 10 or 15 minutes. And as we start walking back to class, we just turn around, we start walking away. And as we walk away, Dale calls out my name. Now, I don't even know if he was allowed to do this, to be honest. But I turned around and he threw me this book. And as I caught this book, I looked down and on the front it said a Christian surfer's Bible, like a Bible. And he just said, oh, do you want a Bible, mate? And I was floored. Like, honestly, I was floored because, and I was really hard-hearted. The biggest thing that changed for me was my heart when I came to faith. Because so hard-hearted, would never get emotional, upset or anything like that. But I remember having this lump in my throat, like I'm trying to hold back tears. Because for the first time in my life, I thought, whoa, maybe there's a God. Like, 
maybe there's a God that loves me. Maybe there's a God that has a plan and purpose for my life. And I just, I turned to my mate and I said, you told him, like you told him to give me this Bible. And he, he grew up in a Christian home, you see. But he just kind of grew up in a Christian home. But he had tears in his eyes because for the first time he saw the power of God. Like the, the faithfulness of, of God answering prayer. You know, he'd put himself out. And he was praying his guts out and he saw the power of God at work. And he said, I promise you, I never said a thing. So a week later, and I'm standing, I'm looking at this Bible going, there's, no, hang on a second. Something had a profound manipulation upon this event. Like this was beyond a coincidence. You know what I mean? Like it had to be beyond a coincidence. Like I really started to think maybe there's a God. Now you would think it was like I raced off to church that following Sunday, but I, I wasn't interested in church, terrified of church. What do they do in church? You know what I mean? I was scared. But over a period of a year, God began to reveal himself to me. And I was interested. I was really intrigued. God, if you're real, I want to know if you're there. And he began to do some, some amazing things in my heart and in my life. But by the end of grade 12, I had a lot of questions about God and he'd revealed himself to me. And I probably got to a point where I was like, okay, God's real. I still wasn't sure about the Jesus thing, that's for sure. But I was like, God's real. I know he's real. He has to be real. But I had a lot of questions. And that same mighty mate invited me to go to Fraser Island with his family. And I wasn't too sure what I knew. There were these like Christians, you know, Christian people that were going. And, um, and uh, I prayed probably one of my first prayers the night before we left. I said, God, i got so many questions that I want answers to. I just want answers. Like, how, do, how does this work? How do you have a relationship with you? What does this look like? And I prayed that prayer. I said, I'd love to sit down with someone and ask them questions. And we left for Fraser the next morning pretty early. We set up the campsite. And I got sitting with these couple of guys. I didn't realize that, yeah, one was a pastor at Bridgie and, and, um, and, uh, and a couple of other guys. And, and the subject of God just got brought up. And I got, them, I got to ask them all these questions. As I asked all these questions, they just answered everything for me. And then one of them, a typical evangelist, what a legend. Um, one of them, it, you know, the Bible says, always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that rests within you. So he goes back to his camp event and he comes back out and he gives him this bit of paper and he says, you don't need to read it now, but just you can have a look at it sometime. And I didn't read it at the time, but, but I sat there, asked all these questions. I took that bit of paper and I remember putting it in my bag. And I spent about 10 days, I think, at Fraser with these, there was a few families that went away and they were all from the local church. I didn't know that, but they were all Christian. And that 10 days transformed, it changed me. It really did. But you know why? It's because I saw something in them. And the best way I can describe it is this. It was like this light shone through them. It's the only way I can describe it. It's like they seemed to have a peace and a joy and contentment. Now, they weren't preaching or anything like that, but they were just on holidays, just enjoying Fraser, forward driving, fishing, all that sort of stuff. But this light seemed to shone through them. And you know what I thought? I want what they have. That's what I thought. I want what they have. And I, you know what? I knew I didn't have it. I knew I didn't have it, but I thought, I want what they have. And that holiday impacted me. And I went back home after that holiday. And I, I, I remember sitting on the edge of my bed and saying, God, what is it? Like, what is it that those people had? I want that. I really wanted it. I desperately wanted it. And I remember that bit of paper that guy had given me. I went and pulled it out. And I opened it up, opened it up. And at the top it said, a prayer to receive Christ. And I, this is why it just amazes me, the gospel. Because I know for a fact I didn't fully understand the gospel. I know it. But you know what? God knows your heart. And I knew I wanted, I wanted to experience God and what that meant to have a relationship with him. I wanted that. And I prayed that prayer. And I didn't understand the fullness of it all, but I prayed that prayer and my life changed. Like it just changed. Everything changed. And for the first time in my life, I experienced a peace and a joy and a contentment like I'd never experienced before, never experienced it before. And I grew up in a great home, very great parents and a great brother and sister, great home. But I always just felt like there was just this one puzzle piece missing. I could never work it out. It was like the cup was nearly full, but not quite. And then I encountered Christ and everything made sense. And I realized, wow. And the cup began to overflow and has never stopped overflowing. When you walk in the ways of him, when you walk in the spirit, there's a, there's a power. It's just something exciting and thrilling about walking in relationship with him. It's so exciting. And, uh, and my life was changed. My life was transformed from that moment on. And I experienced that peace and that joy and the contentment. Still never been to church. That's the other amazing thing. Still never walked into a church yet, but I encountered Christ and everything changed for me. And I knew from that moment, I said, God, I want to tell people about you for the rest of my life. Had no desire to be a pastor. I mean, who would want to be a pastor, you know? Uh, but, uh, but I just said, I said, oh, God, I've got to tell people about you for the rest of my life because everything changed for me. Now, like I said, Christ, and I understood this sacrifice that Christ made for us. Now, we understand this this morning. 
It's one thing to talk about it, but it's another to hear about a life that's been transformed. I'm telling you today, I'm telling you, I was not disappointed when I surrendered my life to Christ. Now, for one of you, could be two, I don't know. But for some of you this morning, you need to do that. And you fought it. Or maybe there's been moments you thought you understood it, but you, you, you realise now, I didn't understand. I didn't understand the fullness of what that looked like. This morning is your morning. This morning is your morning to say, okay, I need you, God, in my life. And I'm telling you, know, D.L. Moody says, give your life to Christ. He'll do a far better job of it than you ever will. And it's true. I mean, I tried to live my life and do it in my own strength, and it's powerless, and it's, and it's so... Uh, yeah, it's so ordinary, so ordinary. But when you surrender to him and he takes control of it, all of a sudden the joy and the peace and the contentment, the thrill is so amazing. And some of you need to do that this morning. But I'm conscious for some of you, you've grown cold. There's maybe a lukewarmness in your heart and in your life and you've been distracted. You know, actually, Corrie ten Boom, thank you, Lord. You know, Corrie ten Boom says this. She says, if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. If the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. And some of you have gotten real busy. And you're, you're, you're engulfed with work. And you know what we do? We try and spiritualize our lives. We do what we want to do. And then we do these you know, spiritual gymnastics around it. And we say, oh, yeah, but it's for God. But really, it's just for you. You just live how you want to live. And we try and spiritualize and put this bent on and say, oh, yeah, but you know, I'm, I'm going to do it for God. But you know what we need to do? We need to surrender. You know, there's something about me. There's this selfishness in me that I need to surrender every single day. I don't know if you, you've experienced that in your own life, but I need to surrender every single day. And some of you have grown maybe lukewarm and cold, and you say, oh, I used to be on fire. I used to be surrendered to him every single day. And this morning you need to re-surrender, re-surrender. I'm reminded of that song by Hillsong. What's, um, what's the singer name again? Brooke Fraser, Brooke Fraser, that, that song, Resurrender. I need to do that every single day. And some of you need to do that this morning as well. We know what Christ has done for us now. Because he sacrificed his life, we can live for him. We can live for him wholeheartedly. Father, we thank you for your word and it's powerful and it changes us and it impacts us. There may be just one. There may be just one this morning. They know deep within their heart. They're not surrendered to you and they've never done it before. If that's you this morning, you'll know it's you because your heart's pounding. And you may even have thought to yourself, how does he know like my story? How does he know this is me? Let me tell you, it's not me. It's the Holy Spirit knocking on that door, knocking on your heart right now. And he's saying to you, surrender this morning. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that. But I also recognize there's some of you that need to re-surrender your heart and say, oh God, forgive me. Forgive me for growing lukewarm. I need to reprioritize my life and put you as truly Lord, truly Lord of my life. So if you, it's you this morning, I just want to lead you in a prayer. It's not the prayer that saves you. It's, your, it's your, your faith in Him, your surrender to Him. But I want to lead you in this prayer, an act of response to Him. God, I just pray. You can repeat this in your head and in your heart. Lord, I pray you forgive me this morning. Forgive me for going my own way and doing my own thing. Forgive me for my sin. And I want to surrender to you. I want to give you my life. I want you to be Lord and Savior of my life. And I want you to take control from this moment on. Thank you for dying for me. And thank you for rising again. I want to live now for you wholeheartedly. Fill me with your spirit. From this moment on, in Jesus' name, amen. Father, I thank you that we can respond to you. I thank you that the prayers that those that have prayed right now, you've heard every single prayer. And God, as I tried to kind of share, but I just felt as well uh, that, that in Mark, you talk about going to all the world and preach the gospel. And also sense that this was a reminder for this church as well. And I love this vision they have down the road in this local nursing home, but you've got more for them. You've got more and you're calling, you're calling us out. You're calling us out with this message to go into all the world and preach the gospel. This message isn't just for us to keep to ourselves, but it's to share with the world. 
And I pray that you use us now as local missionaries wherever we go, realising that we're called everywhere we go. We're called, great God. And I pray that you'd use this church and that we'd see uh, a huge blessing flowing into this church. Many more people coming into the kingdom through, through this church, great God, I really do pray. Use them and stir a passion and a hunger and a fire within their hearts to say, we can't stay still, we must go, we must go, we pray. So thank you, Lord, for the blessing of this church. Thank you for your hand that's upon it. And I pray that you use this church abundantly, great God, I really do ask. So Lord, now in this moment, we want to worship you. Why? Because you're worthy. You're worthy of all praise. You're worthy of all honour. And so we want to worship you now in your precious and mighty name. Amen. Amen. Let's jump up on our feet. I just sense to give him a big shout of praise, you know, just to honour him and praise our great God. But jump up on your feet. Let's worship our great God.